Bienvenue, welcome, obrigado and grüß Gott, friends and foes. I'm Melanie Bennett, usually co-host of the weekly Canadian Gender Wars Report. Today, I'm going to read you some critical theory so that you don't have to. The trans-affirming toolkit for Ontario educators has an entire chapter devoted to something called, well, part of a chapter anyway, pardon me, called anti-oppressive education. I believe this reveals the Marxist revolutionary roots of this educator toolkit. So today, I want to explore how Marxist agitation entered Ontario classrooms by examining Paulo Freire's critical pedagogy. But specifically, I want to examine Canadian critical pedagogues. As an ex-Marxist teacher told me, he viewed three Canadian Freireans, Giroux, Henry Giroux, Joe Kincheloe, and Peter McLaren as Canada's basically second most successful academic influences abroad, number one being Jordan Peterson. And I would say he might be right about that. So today I'm going to look at Peter McLaren. I have limited time to create these podcast videos, whatever, on a weekly basis. I can only focus on one area at a time. And today I'm going to focus on McLaren's background. I'll delve into the roots of critical pedagogy and touch on the influences of other Marxists like Herbert Marcuse and Paolo Freire on McLaren's educational philosophy. All right, let's get to it. Who is Peter McLaren? Well, his story begins in Toronto, where his working class upbringing laid the foundation for a future devoted to education and social justice. As a keen observer of societal changes, McLaren was influenced by the tumultuous new left revolutionary counterculture of the 60s and 70s, including interactions with the Black Panthers and anti-Vietnam War protests, which set the stage for his later engagement with critical pedagogy. The 1960s marked an era of transformative social movements, and McLaren's experiences during this period deeply influenced his perspectives on the role of activism in education. The university environment across North America was especially influenced by social justice and critical theory, as described by Herbert Marcuse. This guy, Marcuse, he's a huge reason the countercultural student radical left movement even existed back then. I'll only touch on his story a tiny bit for, for context, but if you're interested, I do recommend listening to some of his lectures that you can find freely on YouTube. Okay, why am I talking about Herbert Marcuse? In a nutshell, Herbert Marcuse essentially created the framework for critical social justice or critical theory as we know it today. His influence on the American Academy and the new left movement, particularly among university students of the 1960s and 70s, was profound. This really can't be understated. He escaped Germany in 1933 before the Second World War. Long story short, he was a member of the Marxist Frankfurt School and the Germans hated communists. Instead, he came to America. First, he joined the Office of Strategic Services, which essentially was the CIA before the CIA. And then he became a lecturer, I think maybe at Columbia University, but he joined the academe. Fun fact, he was Angela Davis's PhD supervisor. Yep, that Marxist feminist agitator and Communist Party founder. I think she was accused of conspiracy to murder, but was eventually acquitted. Not suspicious at all. Okay, okay, back to the story. Marcuse wrote many influential books and essays, like his critique of societal oppression that calls for radical change in one-dimensional man. This book resonated strongly with students and intellectuals at the time. It still does. Marcuse's ideas became a catalyst for countercultural movements, fueling student activism and groups like the Weather Underground Network, they were a militant, far-left Marxist revolutionary organization. Some describe them as domestic terrorists. They're definitely worth reading about if you haven't heard of them before, but I don't really have time to go into them today. Marcuse's work provided the theoretical framework that shaped the new radical leftism of the time. An entire generation of students was absolutely convinced that capitalism was the enemy and revolution was the only solution. 
these radicals really didn't disappear. They became academics themselves and sought to criticize and transform societal structures. Now, let's take a teeny tiny detour into McLaren's writing to look at a passage that I feel really reflects Marcuse's ideas. This guy has some great titles, just one of them that I'm not going to read from today, but I just really need to share the title of this one. He wrote a book called Che Guevara, Paulo Freire, and the Pedagogy of Revolution by Peter McLaren. I am going to read you some passages from a different book. This one is Pedagogy of Insurrection, From Insurrection to Revolution. Just a reminder, we are talking about education philosophy here. This book was written in 2015. McLaren says, More fundamentally, decolonizing pedagogy is the creation of of an historical identity through understanding the origins of the system that produces the alienation and estrangement experienced by students. Marcuse and many of his ilk, his Marxist ilk, really often talk about this alienation that man experiences and proposes their form of Marxism as a means of overcoming that alienation. You know, that's the same stuff as overcoming those shackles of oppression, really. But you can see it here in his writings. Peter McLaren obtained his Bachelor of Arts in English Literature and a PhD at the Ontario Institute for Studies in Education. I had to look that place up. I remember walking downtown Toronto not long ago. I'm pretty new to Toronto, so I haven't been everywhere across the city. But it was memorable because I remember seeing the title and thinking, I know bad stuff happens in this building. And I took a selfie with the thumbs down. Anyway, I hope you enjoyed that little sidebar, but I'm going to get back to the story now. At this school is where he received his exposure to the radical social justice that ended up being the catalyst for his desire to transform education within the specifically Marxist framework that we'll discuss later in this podcast. It was during his doctoral studies that McLaren's academic path intersected with the work of Paolo Freire. So you may have heard of Freire. He was another Marxist who used the Marcusian critical social justice model that we discussed earlier to create his own version for education, and he called it critical pedagogy. And because it's Marxist, this ideology is intent on liberating society with revolution through education. He was Brazilian, and he was raised at a time where there was incredible poverty and economic equality. He believed the only way to better society was to make people aware of their oppression. His seminal work, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, published in 1968, laid the groundwork for transformative approaches to education. I don't know how many times in the last few minutes I have used the words transformative or to transform. It must have been a ton. But I think this is really important to understand what transformative really means to a Marxist. And you need to understand it because you will come across it over and over and over again when you're looking at educational material, whether it's guidelines, whether it's a policy, whether it's even the political side, any actually all over any kind of critical theory, you will find the word transformative or to transform. They always want to transform something. So we might as well understand what they mean by it. Specifically, in the Marxist context, transformative refers to radical changes aimed at replacing a dominant hegemonic class with a classless, socialist, or communist society. It involves restructuring economic and social systems to eliminate inequality, eliminate exploitation, eliminate class distinctions, etc., etc., et typically through the abolition of private ownership or private property. In this case, the property could be knowledge. That could be the special property that is, that is owned. We want to abolish that. So when you hear things like various ways of knowing, they're talking about abolishing a way of knowing. Usually they mean science by this. Usually mean the scientific process, rational thinking. Freire's ideas resonated deeply with McLaren and shape the trajectory of his academic pursuits. Let's read a little bit more about what McLaren has to say in Pedagogy of Insurrection. He says, Now what do I mean by class struggle? Well, I believe that it's more than an economic struggle between the propertied and propertyless, but it is a political struggle directed at the state. 
And here, the hegemonic class is created through a system of alliances of class factions that can best unify the power block. And winning the battle for democracy means much more than cultivating an ethical distaste for exploitation. It means actively working to end it. McLaren clearly states that his Marxism is not economic. His struggle is against the rational systems that stop Marxism from taking a foothold in society. He wants to use his role as a teacher to destabilize reason. Finding truth through rational inquiry plainly shows the fallacy of communism. So Marxists have to undermine that. They have to destroy that. And he goes on to say that unifying the power block, so unifying all of those individual differing marginal identities, which could be class, sex, race, gender. Now we see it heavily in the classroom because the black trans woman is the most marginalized person in society. And so they have the, the, the largest vote. But you, you unite all of those individual marginalized groups to fight against the white Western man. That's what he's saying, because you have to overthrow using the classroom. You must abolish the established order. Um, this happens over and over with Marxists. They have this idea that they can eliminate inequality, they can eliminate exploitation through this resentful identification of whatever dominant class as the oppressor and essentially undo that. And somehow that's going to create equality that's going to undo exploitation. Never mind that it's never happened in society, in any communist regime, not even in socialist countries who are essentially failing now. Look at Europe. It's having a hard time. And that was the beacon of a socialist success. Anyway, I'm going to come back from this tangent. Let's get back to the text. Paolo Freire's work placed emphasis on dialogue. And that just means conversation-based education aimed at creating awareness of social justice or what Freire called conscientization or conscientizachau. Conscientizing is essentially to go through the process of becoming aware of systems of oppression. I think this is part of the idea of where the word woke came from, is to wake up or to conscientize to the oppression, to become woke. In his book, Pedagogy of the Oppressed, Freire calls for bottom-up revolution, and conscientizing is to actively work against that oppression and to teach others or conscientize them about it. So, in other words, it's kind of like indoctrinating someone and then indoctrinating someone else by constantly looking for hidden oppression. In Peter McLaren's book, Critical Pedagogy and Predatory Culture, Oppositional Politics in a Postmodern Era, 1995, he says, We also agree that forms of power and control have become more difficult to uncover because they are now distinguished with circuits of electronically produced signs and meanings that saturate almost every aspect of public and private life. So here McLaren is telling you, this Freirean worldview, that there is all this hidden oppression, and if we could just uncover it, it's becoming harder to uncover because of technology, but we can do it, guys. Let's get on it. I mentioned liberation. Liberation from all this oppression arises from active participation in dismantling it. You have to understand the difference between liberty and liberation. Liberation, that's the second part of Freire's model, praxis. Praxis is the practical application of theory, big T theory, or the action to take to dismantle oppression. So to Freire, liberation doesn't happen on its own. It comes from applying critique of the systems of oppression as in critical theory. You'll come across this idea of critical thinking over and over, and you'd think they mean starting with a hypothesis, gathering data, evaluating that data, and coming to a rational conclusion based on the information. No, they mean critical as in critical theory, starting with the assumption that there is just all this hidden oppression, and if we could just identify it, just find it, through praxis and dialogue, we could save the world. Taking this back to the queer pedagogy context, queer pedagogy, in my last video we talked about it, is an offshoot of this critical pedagogy. This is the link here. There are many kinds of critical pedagogies. Queer is just the one that's obsessed with undoing 
normativity or everything that's normal. So in that context, the praxis that we hear from in the Transaffirming Toolkit video, the authors often refer to doing the work. I'll drop a link in the description of the Western University video launch for the toolkit. You'll hear them talking about it over and over. When you hear them talking about doing the work, I want you to think about Marxist praxis to liberate children from the oppression of being trapped in a sexed body, whatever that means, or the oppression of being trapped by normative sexuality. And to complete the Freerian indoctrination triad, we have dialogue. Think of this as discussing everything you just learned through the social justice lens, making it social justice, changing it to whatever you understood before into social justice. So that sounds a lot like unlearning. We've heard that before. You need to unlearn and relearn. Back to McLaren. Paolo Freire loved him. Why? Because Freire was an unknown, obscure guy teaching illiterate adults Marx's praxis in Brazil. His career was basically over when McLaren and his buddy Henri Giroux imported and injected Freire's ideas into the American Academy in the 1970s. Henry Giroux is another interesting guy. I don't have time to discuss him today. Maybe I'll come back to him at a later date. But for now, we're just going to focus on McLaren. Right, so let's look at what Freire had to say about working with McLaren. In Critical Pedagogy and Predatory Culture, Freire wrote a preface about McLaren, and he says, Peter McLaren is among the many outstanding intellectual relatives I discovered, and by whom in turn I was discovered. McLaren basically helped to revive Freire's career, and before bringing him to the North American continent, nobody really knew what critical pedagogy was. And it certainly wasn't applied to children. I'm sure you've heard that Canada is the epicenter of the DEI, diversity, equity, and inclusion, anti-oppression model of education, which is infecting the West right now. You could say that McLaren and his contemporaries are probably largely responsible for kicking that off and influencing this critical pedagogy across curriculums in Western countries. Let's hear McLaren describe critical pedagogy in his own words in a book he wrote in 2015 called Life in Schools. He says, Life in Schools is the story of my reinvention as an educator from a liberal humanist who possess the necessity of reform, to a Marxist humanist who advocates a revolutionary praxis. By revolutionary praxis, I mean educating for a social revolution through critical pedagogy. So he is telling you himself. He went from being a liberal, a classical liberal, to a Marxist. He wants to inject revolutionary praxis into education directly to young people. So as I mentioned, Paolo Freire created his model for adults, for illiterate adults, never for children. But McLaren absolutely wants to inject that into children's education. Let's look into some more of what Peter McLaren has to say about his intentions as a critical pedagogue. This is from a different book. This is from Revolutionizing Pedagogy, Education for Social Justice Within and Beyond Global Neoliberalism, 2010. Critical or radical pedagogy is an approach to understand and shaping the tool slash society relationship from the perspective of the social relations of production within the capitalist societies. So what he means by that is Marxists tend to think that the hegemony or the dominant whatever, it keeps reproducing itself and the whole goal of Marxism is to undo whatever dominant class because they don't want it to reproduce itself, but that's a side note. He says, it's also a practical approach to teaching. So first, it's a radical pedagogy. First, it is a uh, political act. Second, it's also a practical approach to teaching. It's also a practical approach to teaching, learning, and research that emphasizes teaching through critical dialogue and dialectic analysis of everyday experience. It's about teaching through praxis. As we explained earlier, the practical application of Marxist theory. It's about teaching through that. Its approach is democratic. 
Don't be fooled. Marxists always call their Marxism democracy for some reason. It is just a manipulation. They just mean Marxism. And it's aimed to bring about social and economic equality and justice for all ethnic groups. It holds the principles of and struggles for race, class, and gender equality. Practitioners including feminist educators, labor rights advocates, queer theorists, and Marxist human humanists, among others. Very interesting that he mentions labor rights activists and queer theorists. Queer theorists, I guess we know now because it's all over the curriculum, but labor rights advocates. I want to just mention here that we have a lot of problems with our unions in Canada. They are entirely corrupted by Marxist ideology. And when I say entirely corrupted, I mean they are entirely corrupted. The, I don't think the average person who's a member of the unions understand how corrupted their unions are by Marxist revolutionary. They literally want insurrection. So it's interesting in 2010, I think that was already starting to be a thing. He goes on to say, there are generally two streams. One stream is the left liberal and attempts to make capitalist society more compassionate so that it better serves the interests of the poor and economically disenfranchised. Yeah, I would say that's like the European style social democrats. The second is generally grounded in a critique of capitalist society, often through an engagement with the writings of Marx, an attempt to work towards a socialist society through the social critique and nonviolent dissent. So what he's telling you here, and again he's talking about teaching, is that you've got two different kinds of people. You've got the old style of lefty, which kind of just wanted some social safety nets. They wanted inclusion. They just wanted to help the marginalized individuals in society. He's like, no, 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 we're not this. This is 2010. We are not doing this. We are Marxists. We are influenced by Marx. We want to use critical theory to bring about a socialist society. And we're going to do it by injecting our philosophy, our ideology directly into children through free Aryan praxis. That's the nonviolent dissent. We can do it through the kids. <laughs> I love this guy. So he does not like those traditional left liberals. He doesn't like them. He says the depredations of progressive, i.e. left liberal pedagogues have often subordinated praxis to the realm of ideas, theory, and the regime of the episteme. But critical socialist pedagogy recognizes the pivotal role of public political action. What has been developed by radical educator Henry Giroux as a public pedagogy is a pedagogy for revolutionary praxis. He's telling you that, you know, those, those liberals, they're too soft. They're just, these are just ideas to them. They're not going to put them in place. We need proper critical socialist pedagogy. We, we really need some of the more extreme guys who are not afraid of injecting that into the curriculum. They're not afraid of trying to bring about this insurrection, this decolonizing. He goes on to say, and here I would argue for a decolonizing anti-capitalist pedagogy. We talk about bias. It could not be clearer that critical pedagogy has a huge bias and the bias is towards Marxist ideology. It's towards communism. I thought schools were meant to be ideologically free from bias, but they're not. These days, we hear a lot about decolonizing. If you look at educational materials, whether it's from the unions, whether it's from schools, often the T TDSB, the Toronto District School Board, has a ton of materials on decolonizing the curriculum. And we've seen with some of these Hamas protests, what have we been told? What did you think decolonizing looked like? So maybe it's not so peaceful as they'd like to tell us it is. And back to some more recent examples. This sounds an awful lot like what the trans-affirming toolkit authors are doing. To give context, the toolkit argues that inclusion, that, that that others people, that it marginalizes them, that it makes them want to take a long walk off a short plank, basically. What the toolkit is advocating for is affirmation. So that's the dialectic advancement. We have to just take it that, you know, a little bit further all the time. These incremental advancements from inclusion to affirmation. That's the critical pedagogy element here. You don't make special accommodations for a single person should a kid identify as trans. No, 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 no. You queer the entire school to encourage kids to identify as trans. 
Let's look at an example from the toolkit. This is taken from chapter two, frameworks for unlearning, anti-oppressive education. Let's see what they have to say about pronouns. So they're saying in an inclusive school, a student can share their pronouns and have them respected if they differ from the pronouns that would be associated with their sex at birth. That's what the soft liberal would do, the soft left liberal. They would just be inclusive. They would just say, okay, that's cool. You have gender identity and you want different pronouns. Sure, no worries. We're going to make that uh, accommodation for you. That's not what they want. They want an affirming school. In an affirming school, all students and staff know what pronouns they use. They use them to introduce themselves. They're able to articulate why they use these pronouns and they're comfortable asking for pronouns and apologizing if and when they mess up. They understand why more gender inclusive pronoun use is needed and are committed to having conversations with students about the fact that not everyone identifies with their birth assigned gender identity. Name and pronoun changes are seamlessly integrated across the system wide platforms such as attendance, student portals, and school payment portals. So lots of words here to say, well, we need to queer the entire curriculum. This is not just for that one student. We need to make this a thing for all students. Not only that, we need to make sure that all of the teachers, all of the educators, all of the staff, they're already primed. They're already allies. They can articulate why they're part of, why they've become queer Marxists, why they're allied with this ideology. They should be able to articulate that and further conscientize the students. This is praxis. Affirming schools is queer Marxist praxis. Let's do one more example. We have here gender diversity and trans inclusion. In an inclusive school, the staff make up the topic of gender diversity as part of Pride Month and or designated days like Pink Shirt Day, International Day Against Homophobia, Transphobia and Biphobia. So, you know, we just have these days and we say, okay, this is fine. Again, that's the soft lefty liberal approach. That's what McLaren is saying. You know, these guys, they know that praxis is a thing. They, they agree with us, but they're soft. So they just have this day. Okay, so just including us uh, marginally. They're othering us. They're saying... They want an affirming practice, and that's where there's a commitment to integrating a focus on gender diversity and trans inclusion into and across the curriculum, inclusive of grade and subject matter. They're saying, well, look, we, again, we need to infuse this across the entire curriculum. We need to do it from kindergarten, pre-kindergarten. We need to make it a priority across the entire curriculum for all ages, because this is, this is a commitment we have to have in an affirming school. This is not just a day. This is like all the time. We need to queer everything all the time. Anything else is just, well, that's just transphobic. That is just bigotry. It's showing that commitment that McLaren was talking about, that commitment to Marxist praxis. So let's go back to 1995, critical pedagogy and predatory culture. McLaren says, critical pedagogy as a form of cultural politics is also concerned with constructing a language that empowers teachers to take seriously the role of schooling in joining knowledge and power. So already we're talking about making sure that we take control of not, of not only the, the language, but we want to take control of the language so that we can take control of knowledge. We can make that Marxist. Teachers need critical categories that probe the factual status of white, Western, androcentric epistemologies that will enable schools to interrogate as sites engaged in producing and transmitting social practices that reproduce the linear, profit-motivated imperatives of the dominant culture with its attendant institutional dehumanization. So already in 1995, there's this hostility towards white people because, look, there's, the hostility is always going to be whatever is viewed as the dominant class. And so in this case, white, well, white is not a thing. Uh, white people is not a race, but so already in 1995, we have a problem with white. Uh, you have a problem with Western. There's a problem with androcentric, so male centered. And this is what they, we want to destroy. So we need to find new language to allow us to take control of knowledge, a new way of knowing, and to take, to take that power to decentralize, to destroy the hegemonic 
uh, power structure, well, in their paranoid mind, the, the hegemonic power structure of white Western men, basically, which is funny because he is a white Western man. Taking it back to the toolkit, there is oodles of this kind of thinking in the actual toolkit. Let's look at some examples in anti-oppressive education. The following resources provide further understanding about the gender binary in a colonial and white supremacist structure, rather than a natural and indisputable truth. Three things here. Colonial, we want to undo Western society. White supremacist, we want to undo what we view as white culture. And they want to do what they see as a natural and indi- or what, what the, their paranoid mind thinks that people see as a natural and indisputable truth. Well, that is the various ways of knowing. In their mind, that this is the postmodern sort of, there's so many different ways of understanding the world that, that you know, relying on, on one and the West tends to rely on en- enlightenment values, scienti- scienti- scientific inquiry. And so they view that as oppressive. They want to undo that. This is very Marxist orientated, as you can see through McLaren. Some of the examples in the toolkit, the toolkit has a lot of resources. They even provide this resource here. The gender binary is a tool of white supremacy. And they'll give you some diatribe on that. The, the binary is a white co- uh, colonialist fiction, and it's up to white cishet folks to disrupt it. It's just Marxism, 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 Marxism over and over and over again. If you understand where this is coming from, it becomes so obvious. I love the contradictions in this document. At the very beginning of the anti-oppressive education section of the toolkit, it tells you number one here, education for the other. Schools must be made safe and helpful for students who are oppressed. What are the, these students, how are they oppressed? We live in a Western rich country. I mean, it's getting worse day by day, but there's bullying. Sure, that happens because young people are young people. But who are all these oppressed students? When did all this oppression happen? I don't remember my grandmother talking about oppression and she had to go through a world war. I don't remember her talking about all this you know, anti-woman oppression, even though she had eight, eight children. Uh, It's just unreal. But anyway, moving on. They say, this also means that students must be affirmed in their identities and no assumption should be made about them. Yet in the blurb right next to it, it says, educators must recognize, embrace, and name the differences between students' identities and acknowledge and affirm differences, tailor their teachings to the specifics of their students' population. But hang on, do you make assumptions or not? If you categorize them, then we must make assumptions on those categories. I'm a child of the 90s. I grew up in the 90s. That was, those were my formative years. And I remember very, very clearly that we used to say, you can't put, you can't put labels on me, man. I don't, I don't conform to labels. And all of a sudden, we've gone from that to, I have all of these labels. And you, you, you can't make assumptions about my labels, except I'm going to give you my labels. And then we'll make assumptions about my labels. Section two, education about the other. Students, for the most part, are only ever taught about cisgender people with the inference that birth assigned gender is the only legitimate gender identity. This is just code for there are many ways of knowing. There's lots of ways of knowing. You You have to respect this way of knowing because we're Marxist. Such knowledge is partial and encourages a distorted and misleading understanding of the other that is based on stereotypes and myths. I'm just going to pause here because my understanding of gender theory is that it is entirely based on stereotypes. Because if you if you think about the gender unicorn, um, or even if you, if you think about the last video that I made, I talked about the YRDSB gender identity guidelines, the York Region District School Board gender identity guidelines. And in there, it tells you So you are cis if you conform to the social expectations of your sex at birth. But those are stereotypes. The contradictions are beautiful. It goes on to say that uh, Kuman Shower, the person this, uh, this is based on, suggests that while educators can choose to include specific units of study that focus on the other, so we can maybe have a day to talk about uh, people's, maybe there's some kids that are trans, for example, A more effective method is to integrate otherness throughout the curriculum. Here again, we're talking about this infusion into the curriculum. This is the critical pedagogy element of the toolkit, because this affirmation model really is just critical pedagogy. It's about 
really making sure that it is infused throughout the entire school at every level in every way because this is an ideology it's not it's called pedagogy but it's really a means of injecting it's like a hypodermic needle injecting the poison that's what they're trying to do they're not really trying to teach people to be kind to others they're trying to put this ideology into kids malleable minds I'm just going to take you through one last little part of the toolkit as an example. Here it's saying critical media literacy. Remember, critical is critical theory with a capital T, in this case, critical pedagogy with a capital P, can help students recognize that the school system is not neutral and that the materials they are exposed to have lessons beyond the general content, which reflects societal priorities. So for example, looking at which scientists are highlighted in the main text as experts, and which scientists are placed in spotlight positions, present alternative perspectives. These reflections can be to scaffold conversations around privileging and othering. So what they're saying really is to apply this critical social justice lens, the critical pedagogy, the critical theory with the capital T to make sure that you uncover the oppression that is happening. In this case, we're talking about education. And so the oppression is certain types of knowledge, which is interesting because the queer Marxists are the establishment opinion. They keep bleating on about trans genocide and the self-deleting of kids because parents are going, hang on a minute, this doesn't seem right. They are the establishment opinion. They have the major institutions on their side. Medical, nursing, psychological media. We've seen this in Alberta. The main institutions of influence are completely on board with the queer Marxism. So in terms of influence, they are very much the majority opinion. And parents fighting back are the minority opinion. But in the toolkit, they're claiming that they themselves are the marginal voice that people should listen to. So you need to learn to see through these poorly made arguments because they're not based in fact. They're not even based in their own arguments. Their arguments will change depending on what suits at the time. The ultimate aim here is to get you to accept the queer Marxism. For them, the best of the best outcomes would be for you not just to let them do their own thing, but to actually get you to come on board as, a, as an ally. The critical pedagogy bit is at the, at the high school level, teachers can start to explicitly examine with students the ways in which systems of oppression work together to shape what knowledge is presented as normal or othered. For example, in biology, examining the role of racism, colonialism, and white supremacy in the shape of gender norms. This is entirely the queer Marxist. We saw it with McLaren over and over. Um, but the queer aspect of this is the no normativity really is we really want to make the abnormal normalized. We really want to center abnormal. We want to deconstruct normal. We want to undo tradition. We want to undo the scientific way of knowing. We want to undo all that. So we need to teach the students through praxis through conscientization of all of this oppression that exists so that they can learn to ignore rational thinking so they can think critically with a critical theory capital t way of understanding the world with a social justice lens that's what they're telling you in this i'd like to close off this analysis with one more bit by mclaren in pedagogy and predatory culture in 1995 he talks about the politics of pleasure, so I'm just going to read through a little bit of that. He says, Resistance became a way of gaining power, celebrating pleasure through the shattering of sanctioned codes, queer theory, and fighting oppression in the lived moment and the concrete and social materiality of the classroom. To resist meant to fight the monitoring of passion and desire and the capitalist symbolization of the flesh. Again, this is just an early introduction of queer theory into 1995 queer Marxist or just uh, Marxist texts. And we're talking about children. He's actually talking about teaching children in school, about undoing the shackles of this fleshly pleasure oppression. He says, 
It was a reaction against the purging of the body's opportunity to invest in the pleasure of transgression and elicit knowledge in favor of a disembodied ideal of what constitutes proper modes of desire and patterns of conduct demanded by civil society. Resistance constituted a willingness of students to struggle against the prospect that their indigenous constructions of gender, sexuality, and identity could become rewritten and demonized by the subjectivity defined tropes of Anglo male authorities and through narratives defined by the division between high status knowledge and culture of the middle class and the degraded knowledge and cultural otherness of the subaltern. I don't know. I found that surprising personally to see that written at that time. I knew that queer theory sort of arose around then, but I was surprised to see this because he's not a queer, he's not a queer Marxist. He's just, he's just a Marxist. He's just a Marxist that wanted to find a way to revolutionize or create revolutionaries in the classroom. But already at this time in 1995, he was already starting to um, espouse and to promote queer theory. Because he's saying here, th this mode of resistance is about deconstructing and transgressing all of the proper ways of expressing sexuality and bodily pleasure. Anyway, that's what I'm going to end on for today. I hope you liked this analysis. Like I said, I don't have a huge amount of time to go through these every week, but I try to share what I'm reading, share my understanding of it. If you like it, it would be really helpful if you dropped a comment, maybe tell me what you think. Uh, maybe you could even like and subscribe. <laughs> that would be really helpful. I really enjoy making these, so I hope that you enjoy them too. And I will be back soon with another analysis. If you like this video, please consider liking and subscribing or check out one of our other videos. Here's a couple of suggestions.